Coffee Carmen Connection is about being human. It's about you choosing to prioritize your well-being, putting the time in to strengthen your resilience to adversity, and being part of a community that holds you accountable and offers support when the going gets tough. Our podcasts bring expert insight and real life experiences together for you to enjoy and learn what it is that makes us human and how to work with it. Good morning, Greg. Thank you so much for joining me on uh, this morning's episode of Coffee Calm Connection. I hope you've got a coffee to hand. Not quite. I've already finished mine uh, and it's sort of not even 10 yet, so I'm moving over. Uh, that's that's fair enough. I think I'm on about coffee number five, but don't tell anyone. Um, so, uh, Dr. Gre- Gregory Warwick is your full title. I wonder if you can tell us who uh, Dr. Gregory Warwick is and what your background is. Yeah, so I'm a counselling psychologist. Uh, I'm over in Salford, Manchester, um, working out of Quest Psychology Services. So we've been running for two years um, and kind of mainly specialise in sort of PTSD, but we kind of help general public with sort of private therapy, uh, depending on kind of whatever people need. Fabulous. And one of our conversations that we've had in the past is around how COVID has perhaps changed both the need and the distribution of therapy in all guises. And uh, we thought that'd be quite an interesting topic for us to discuss. So I wonder if you can give us your kind of clinical uh, opinion or, or um, experience and what you've seen throughout COVID and what your expectation is for sort of the, the scorpion's tail of COVID as we as we as we come out. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think you know most people have seen sort of in the news and, and probably experienced it themselves that I think mental health has changed drastically within COVID. I think the idea of sort of restrictions and lockdowns have been really tough. Um, and from a service perspective, I mean the NHS services seem to be having waiting lists of sort of 18 months plus at the minute so just massively overwhelmed Um, but from my point I suppose what's been interesting is that shift from uh, as we have had to and and most businesses have had to adapt from face-to-face to to online therapy Um, and it's not a new concept but I think it was something that was really seen as lesser perhaps for a long, long time, and that's really taken up um, massive, massive change. I think hopefully that sort of culture shift will, will carry on going forward as it kind of opens new doors to the different types of maybe support people get, how they can access it, um, as, as well as maybe some other sort of projects and sort of further things around sort of AI and self-help. I've seen um, a few things, you know how you get um... Facebook sponsored messaging that comes up in news feeds and I've seen a few things aimed at teens uh, and children that are text based therapy which Mm. my initial reaction was oh no but um, that I have a, a close friend who's got a daughter who Yeah, definitely. Like, um, so I, I'm in my 30s and what we consider as like digitally native. So that idea being that kind of grew up with social media, video games and like the languages computer was kind of, you know, that was that was in my schooling. So that's really natural. So I wonder if there's kind of some generational aspect as to what people find acceptable. But I think there's definitely that shift um, towards so we call it internet relay chat so that idea that there's no other cues um, other than kind of text-based but the research shows that it doesn't impact on the outcomes of therapy um, so I think you probably are likely to see it much much more um, especially in that instant messenger format mm. back and forth. Can you tell me a bit more about what you've said there what what sort of research has been done um, and what 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 is it saying? Yeah, um, so I guess when you think about kind of the different types of therapy, so you've got um, without visual and audio cues, so like text only, which is 
internet relay chat that we've just said. You've got purely audio therapy, which is like telephone. So you get kind of a lot of employee assistance programs would do that, the Samaritans, those types of charities. Um, then you've got video conferencing, like a little bit like we're doing today, kind of having it over Skype or uh, even WhatsApp web. Um, and then you've got remote, which is kind of the, the self-help apps or the self-guided sort of CBT structures or programs. Um, and that's now developing to include things like VR, if you were sort of doing exposure therapies and things like that. Um, so I guess when you think about kind of the research, so um, part of my thesis and interest was around internet relay chat. And um, I did an experiment where people would do therapy with one another, um, just using text to see how it was. And what it kind of found was that it didn't matter that you didn't have these kind of these gestures, the facial expressions, um, if the connection was there, and, and that's really in line with a lot of other research like Lambert, um, if the connection's there, therapeutic change can happen. Um, so, uh, you know, quite old research from, from sort of Lambert, they call it Lambert's pie. 30% of all therapy change, it doesn't matter what model you're doing, as long as the relationship's there, that, that's what causes the change. And how, how do you develop a relationship through text only? Um, and I suspect that younger generations, so two questions, um, I suspect this answer will be different for different generations, but somebody of my generation might find it harder, and again I'm in my 30s, late 30s, but 30s still clinging on, um, my generation might find that harder than sure. perhaps somebody of my kids' generation. So how much of your research looked at the gender uh, uh, differences and age differences? Didn't, no, haven't, haven't actually sort of looked into the intricacies of that. Um, I guess maybe for a little bit of context on, on one of your questions. So they were using Skype as a platform just with the text. And I guess that allows you to add in emojis for expression. Um, you can kind of, uh, there's this idea of describing kind of what you're doing. So people might put in uh, two asterisks like an action. So for example, our oh, hug um, and, and sort of having that as, as a context. Um, so I think there are ways to top it up and, and ways to add to it. Um, and I, I'm not sure how that would impact on perhaps genders. Um, I guess when you think about generational, I guess as time's gone on, there are more and more, uh, you know, technologies developed to be able to add extra things in. Um, I think uh, I'm not an iPhone user, but you see kind of people have been able to sort of scan their face and have an emoji of themselves. So it's a lot more expressive than it once was. Um, yeah, I think it's so interesting. And I think actually it feeds into a much wider topic of, of communication generally. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and how we as sort of beings communicate with one another, which is, in my opinion, possibly not popular, uh, we've lost that ability to communicate because uh, in a lot of ways because communication is as much about listening as it is about talking. And that latter element uh, isn't always present in interactions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um... Because I suppose timing, when you think about these types of therapies or this type of communication when it's online, timing's a massive thing. Um, I don't know how many kind of online meetings you've been in recently where people are talking over one another or, you know, there's there's a delay or and when that's without visual cues as well, when you're trying to time kind of an intervention or uh, a response, um, that, that can be quite difficult. I also wonder if there's a there's a conversation to have around different needs. So, for example, one of my children is is on the uh, autism spectrum, and I remember in the first lockdown when when it was uh, online learning, there was the, the particular school had some safeguarding policies which meant children weren't allowed to put their cameras on, hmm. which meant my daughter was listening, watching a black screen or a screen with some maths on or something and listening and she found it so difficult and it led to all kinds of problems. And I suppose, yeah. you know, that might feed into how effective um, online therapy can be in all the guises you've suggested. 
definitely i think you you know you have to be comfortable not with the, just the person you're working with but with kind of the the model or the i suppose the vehicle of therapy in itself um i, I think it's I feel like it's a little bit sort of horses for courses, you know, that idea of it's not going to suit everyone. Um, there'll be, when you sort of single it down to sort of autism, I guess there'll be some people that really cope without having all the extra worry that they're being seen. But for other people, that that gap is sort of filled with extra worry and uh, misunderstanding. Um, mm. So it's really, yeah, really difficult. I think that's probably what I'm... So I'm so interested in how COVID has changed the world, right? Mm. Um, because I don't think COVID single-handedly has changed the world. I think COVID has exacerbated change that will, changes that were already coming, um, particularly around communication and, um, uh, you know, uh, interaction, I suppose, with, with peers, with clients, with family, with, with, with prospects, uh, employees, etc. So I, th I think it's really, really interesting. Um, one of the things that you've just touched on there and obviously feeds directly into Coffee Calm Connection and what we are building is this idea that there's a there's, there's a, an increase in sort of self-help platforms and yeah. information available. What, what sort of things are you seeing? Yeah, so I think um, so self-help is definitely not a new concept. Like from the 70s, you used to be able to get sort of self-help tapes. Um, it's just the the format I think is is starting to change. Um, so the NHS, in terms of like a stepped level, um, so it's called IAP, so introducing access to psychological therapies. That's that big movement um, to get uh, therapy into the NHS. So in that staged approach, pretty much everyone, um, unless you've got quite a complex or comorbid mental health problem, you start with um, self guided CBT. So this idea of um, here is a web program, here are some skills and tools, um, try these and uh, every sort of couple of weeks someone will check in to see how you're getting on. Um, so there's that. Um, and then we're also seeing, you know, a range of apps that I think are becoming more and more popular. Um, everyone knows pretty much around sort of Headspace and, um, you know, some of some of those types of apps. Um, use kind of things like calm harm as well um which are quite good for uh stopping people who are sort of really um distressed so those apps are kind of around and um we're starting to find as well you can get more that shift towards um that slight connection so there are apps that we might use within sort of eating disorder therapies where i can check kind of how you're getting on with your meals throughout the week when i don't see you and things like that um so you've got that side of things um, which are becoming really popular. And I think when you look at the data in terms of effectiveness, the outcomes largely the same as working with someone. Uh, cost effectiveness is obviously quite, uh, quite good um, as that comes out. I'm surprised about the outcomes. I suppose it de depends again on what the objective is or what the particular um, problems are around. But I'm yeah. surprised that outcomes are, I mean, I'm just thinking about myself, right? I did not, could not get on with Zoom hit classes because I just didn't okay. do them. Um, I need the accountability of the face-to-face -face person being there. And I know it's very, yeah. very different, but um, from my own experience, and I have experienced um, uh, sort of I spoke to, to Alicia Davis, who I think is fabulous. She's a clinical psychologist and she describes it as the worried well. So um, so from my own experience in dealing with anxiety or low mood, uh, having that accountability in external persons always been quite important. So for me, the accountability thing is, is critical, but I suppose it's also the progress, which is actually part of the reason behind the development of coffee calm connection mm. because um i suppose accountability actually just rethinking what i've said accountability for me doesn't necessarily have to be somebody there in the same room but it does have to be um a progression i need to see the the the, the process and, and where we're going and that's sometimes helpful when you've got somebody in the room but that's actually what we what we've done with coffee calm connection is um we're in the process now of designing very short courses that can fit in 
in somebody like me's day. So it's only five minutes a day, but over a period of 30 to 60 days where you can really focus on a particular topic. Mm. So some of the stuff that, you know, yourself and I've spoken about and, and some of the, the, the content that we've got um, other people developing as well, as well is around this idea of um, how do you self-motivate? Um, how do you um, how do you deal with that dip when you have that dip and you self sabotage? Uh, how do you deal with anxiety? But also, rather than what what I really felt was missing and what what really resonates with me is I want to know why. So I want to know what is actually happening in my brain, like what neuro pathways have developed and sure. what do I need to do to take that negative habit and turn it into a positive habit and, and what actually will, how will I be changing the infrastructure? Because once I've got some of the education around it, I feel more self-motivated because I can start to see little um, sort of uh, progressions in, in the desired outcome. And I suppose that for me is what Coffee Calm Connection is. And that's yeah. why I'm grateful to be working with people like yourself. Yeah, definitely. I do think there's something within that accountability aspect. Um, you know, I think uh, holding people, you know, I, I joke with people about doing homework and, and, you know, it is a large part of kind of some parts of therapy, um, having to do that and then come back and show that they practice a skill or, or how they've got with it. Um, I think that can be replicated within the self-help materials. You know, you can see sort of structures or... Um, have kind of certain tools that mark your progress um so i definitely think it can be done um i guess what you were saying there about wanting to know yourself so that you can change it and i suppose that's often a common criticism of these kind of self-help materials is that they can be marketed as a one-size-fits-all uh, and as a result it's not very tailored so i think the benefit of com uh, coffee calm collection is that as you sort of split the modules up as you split each sort of lesson up that's where some of that individualization can come um to, to help with that actually you know what i agree with you 100 percent there and one of the things that's been really important to me and i've been non-negotiable on on the build of the, the tech uh in this aspect is this interactive nature mm -hmm. but also so um so I might be able to put, you know, my top concerns of today down. And if you ask me next week, I can't remember what they are because actually it's changed. So I wanted something that was a record, but also that, that built on what you're saying. So yeah. it is tailored. And that, that for me has been really important. It's actually been a huge learning curve working with uh, the professionals that I'm lucky to work with to build these courses because I'm learning a lot about myself and I sort of put myself as the target market, I suppose. Definitely. Um, so and I'm just hoping that I resonate with other people. Yeah. <laughs> there could be assumption floor number one. Who knows? <laughs> we'll find out. Um, no, I do, I do think the whole thing is really important and I really really um think this idea that that ai based therapy is is a thing and and we are sort of moving towards that in in many many ways tell me because you've done a little bit of work around this mm. haven't you and i know it's quite niche at the moment tell me what ai based therapy is yeah so it's something that's never really worked um I think it's kind of, I can imagine for a lot of people within my profession, so you kind of have perhaps maybe some of the older generations who are slightly sceptical of technology before even thinking it as a profession. I mean, it's a massive threat, you know, this automation and, and machine sort of process of, right, let's get rid of therapists and have, you know, these AI bots that will do it for us. Um, so it is something that's never really worked, but it's something I'm really fascinated in because um, going back to kind of one of our, discussions around where well, you just need text to have a relationship with someone um, and if relationship is that one of the main drivers of change well do you need another person for that um, and I suppose ultimately the argument is yes but if we could replicate that then then perhaps so th they've tried this before um, so in the 70s um, you had a guy called uh, Wasbaum and they made this computer program called Eliza um, and it's, it's really famous and you can log on to the internet and have, an and have a go now um, with it. Um, what made it so good is that it is possibly considered as one of the computer programs that may have passed the Turing test if it was applied to it. 
Um, What's the Turing test? So the Turing test was developed by Alan Turing. And, uh, it's based on the protection game. So that was a game where you would have uh, two judges, male and female, and two participants, male and female. And blindly, through um, through communication, you had to work out whether the participant was male or female. When you apply it to the Turing test, you would have one human operator asking questions, you would have one human participant and the computer. And the idea was that the computer would um, replicate and respond to questions in such a way that you couldn't tell if it was a person or a computer. Um, I did that to some degree. Um, it would respond quite well um, in what we'd call like a Rogerian manner. So within therapy, that would be um, paraphrasing to feel understood and reflecting that back as a question. So you might say, uh, having a really bad week, and you'd say, oh, bad week how? And it would carry on the conversation and, and replicate like that. Um, the problem with Eliza was that after a few, because it was all pre-written scripts, it fell apart after a certain one, you get caught in loops, and then you could tell. Um, so with now today's AI, I wonder whether or not you might be able to actually improve on that. The, the difficulty would be not having, so when you talk about artificial intelligence, not just artificial intelligence in the set that there would be thousands of pre-written scripts and it, how it would respond, but actually adapting to the, the input. So two things, right? One thing that I found terrifying. I recently read a book which I speak about in all my podcasts, so apologies to people who listen to them all. Uh, you probably know the book. You probably don't need to read it now. Um, it's Mo Gowda, and it's Solve for Happy. Mo uh, was the chief business officer for Google X. And one of the things that he said, and I forget now if it was actually in his book or one of his podcasts, um, that what is happening is uh, – Artificial intelligence is, if you think of it as a child at the moment, so it's it's, it's mm. a toddler, right? And what do toddlers do? They learn from their environment and they learn emotional as well as uh, actual intelligence. And the, the AI that is learning now is toddler, but it's learning emotional as well as actual intelligence. And it sits behind the internet, yeah. essentially. So the interaction that's happening on the internet there's a massive, a massive part of that that is negative and, and, and unhappy and angry and aggressive. And that is what we are teaching the AI now. And what he says is by 2050, that AI will be in its late teens, early 20s uh, and will be comparable in terms of intelligence to Einstein and a fly and us with a fly. Right. So when you put it in those perspectives, why would Einstein keep the fly yeah. about, right? So this is obviously very dramatic and very, um, you know, what's that that film, yeah. iRobot with uh, Will Smith? So, I mean, this is along those lines. But Google X is at the cutting edge of this type of technology. So the chief business officer talking to us about this is, for me, is really scary stuff. Um, so that was the first point I wanted to make and question what you think about it. The second point is I recently signed up to a subscription, which was I did it in part for Coffee Con Connection Research, but in part actually because I thought it was interesting. Um, and as part of this, you get access to a one to one consultant, right, that messages mm -hmm. you and you don't, you know, you have to pick your triggers. I haven't signed in for three days. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. And at this point, it kicks in this person messaging you. And I didn't know if it was a bot or a sure. real person. And I that absolutely changed my interaction with it because I was every time I wrote, I was yeah. testing, you know, and I would put things in a complicated way and, um, you know, try and see what was going on. And I'm still <laughs> not sure. And, and there's, a, there's a trust element yeah, for me definitely. in that. Definitely. Um, it makes me think, so, so when you talk about, those two kind of um, sort of areas that you've highlighted there. I suppose the first one makes me think about almost the kind of that superhero element of like using your powers for good or evil, and it kind of makes me think like it could be really, really good, and fantastic in the right hands, and and really detrimental if not. Um, so I'm personally quite excited by it, but don't have that trust in human nature that it'll always be used well. 
I, I totally agree with you. And I think what's going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years is going to be fascinating, not just from a mental health space, not just from an AI space, but from from an entire society globally where we're going. Because COVID, there's so many political things yeah. going on in the world that you watch and you kind of go, oh, how how's this going to play out? What What's going to happen here? So it's fascinating. It just be really great to watch it from yeah. somewhere else just in case it goes horribly wrong Definitely. um i suppose thinking about your second experience with you know the part you spoke about your experience with this um this new subscription it it makes me think why ai therapy might become a thing or why people will certainly explore it in the future is that we're kind of in this culture now of immediacy so if i want something i can go on amazon it will, it will arrive tomorrow um, there are the benefits of private therapy is that you're not waiting 18 months for NHS therapy. The Some of the competitors now, um, there are some websites that would uh, say they can match you up with an appointment in this afternoon, this immediate kind of like, I need help, I'll find someone and get it. So I think similar to what you said there, this reminder, this accessibility in terms of all the time, I think that will become a selling point as it feels like culture is very much moving to that way. And an AI therapist would be able to do that 24-7. Um, and when you look at Eliza and how that happened, whilst it wouldn't pass the Turing test as it did, it might now, but it creates significant enough relationships that it caused therapeutic change. And people were devastated. Some of the participants were devastated when it got switched off and they found out it wasn't real. So if you apply that to now, I mean, people might never know, you know, even even with your testing, people might never know. Yeah. Uh, do you know, I, I think the point you've made there is is critical. This uh, instant gratification, immediacy, I want yesterday mm. and I'm going to get yesterday, is actually something that um, is becoming a subconscious expectation of your world around you and will trump things like building a relationship and sure. trust as as we extend that i just need someone right now to listen to the problem yeah. i've got and i don't care who it is listen to me and tell me what i need that 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 mentality is already here in many many ways so yeah definitely and, and it provides a real therapeutic challenge for, for us because um the whole aim of the and it's, it's a really weird one is that you're trying to get as close as you physically can with someone knowing that you'll probably never see them again and the best sort of therapies in my opinion is ones that are time limited because you're trying to empower someone if you have therapy on tap why do i need to learn to regulate my own emotions why do i need to learn skills about how to cope because you know, Dr. greg will be there you know 11 o'clock at night and he'll just get on with it and help me do it so that's a really interesting point and probably one of my um my own anxieties for my kids is because um and i had a really interesting conversation with a teacher around covid and the impact on kids and she was saying school should be doing more in terms of their trauma um recognition and support and having empathy and i said i agree with that to an extent but um empathy without ownership doesn't develop a skill set that allows somebody mm. to be empowered, take responsibility, build their own resilience. It, it doesn't. It allows this victim mentality. And in sure. my view, the, the, there is a big part of the mental health movement that supports the victim mentality without giving the ownership and empowerment. And for me, Coffee Calm Connection is about is about the latter part of that because because I think it's really, really important. And that point that you've just made worries me because it's absolutely valid. When it's on tap, why do I need to regulate? It's always somebody else is there to fix me. And you will never be fixed if your expectation is somebody else is going to do it for you. How do you build that into AI? How can an AI say, come on, dude, pull your socks up. What are you going to do about it? It can't because you add that to like, I'll be sued. <laughs> And the other point, of, if you think about who has created the AI and the purpose of it, why would you want to if that was generating income? So again, that idea of about, you know, using it for good or evil, um, you can you can definitely maintain someone's um, 
uh, position. So it, was, we, uh, it relates quite nicely to, uh, uh, there's a theory called like the dreaded drama triangle. So this idea that you have on, on a triangle, you have victim, persecutor and rescuer. Um, so the victim is someone who goes into that rhetoric, they play that role. Um, the rescuer, whilst it sounds nice, is someone that actually keeps them in that role. Uh, so someone who uh, doesn't coach them to find ways of doing it, they do it for them. And I think that's largely, you know, that dynamic that you're talking about there um, really keeps people there. And what do you do? How do you recognise if you're in that triangle and what can you do to get out of it? Uh, so million dollar can't... question. Yeah, the million dollar question. Um, so on the flip side, you, you'd want the victim to become the creator. So they come up with their own solutions. So, uh, you know, whilst they have therapy could be really good, perhaps limiting it to self-help things like coffee, calm collection, where that person has the validation of what they're going through, but actually here is what you as a person need to do to, to, to help yourself and get better. Um, the rescuer, so in, in this case, maybe it's you and I, it's the people that are helping make the app, and that's, well, we don't do it for them, we coach them. We, we Okay, great. Here is the thing that you need to go look at, but you need to go look at that. I'm not going to do it for you. Um, yeah. uh, I think that is really interesting and actually uh, we should talk offline about that being the subject of one of the Coffee Calm Connection courses because I think it'd be incredibly interesting. Sure. I think that's a really um, an interesting note to end on and I'd like to ask anybody listening for um, to email me with any thoughts, questions, uh, comments on what we've spoken about because it is a new area. It, it is changing. Um, I've got loads of anxieties about it. I'm sure other people do as well. Uh, and I'd really, um, you know, if any comments and questions come in, then Greg, perhaps we can do another one of these of conversations about that. Really, really interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Your reviews, shares and followership is incredibly valuable to us. If you'd like to know more about our work through Coffee Calm and Connection and how we can support you, please email us at hello at coffeecalmconnection.org or follow us on social media. Thank you.